Welcome to The Wonder, exploring perspectives, rituals, and observances of modern naturalistic, earth-revering, pagan religious paths. Here are your hosts, Yucca and Mark. Welcome back to The Wonder, science-based paganism. I'm your host, Mark. And I'm Yucca. Today we're going to talk about bringing the natural world that's outside where we live more into integration with the natural world that's inside where we live, having more of a sense of connectedness between the two of those and kind of a, an approach to worldview that helps to feed us and help us to be happier. Right. So really talking about cultivating our environments both on an external level and on that emotional internal level as well. Right. Yeah. So I think this is a really fun one, especially as we're getting more into spring and into this warmer kind of time of the year. But yeah, let's let's go ahead and get into this idea of kind of bringing that in or as you were saying before, kind of blurring the lines between the outside and inside. Sure. And I really agree with you. I think that springtime is a great time to talk about this because there's so much that's really beautiful that's happening in the world right now in the in the spring season in the Northern Hemisphere. And a lot of how much we're going to get out of that depends on our mindset. Mm -hmm. And it depends on what kind of habits we've developed for ourselves. We were talking before we started recording about how the the human sensorium is geared to look for problems because problems threaten us right and so solving problems becomes a way that you keep yourself from getting eaten right the person who didn't worry about that those weird noises that they heard around the campfire got eaten and then didn't have babies so right. those people aren't our ancestors the ones who were anxious and worried are our ancestors yeah right Exactly. So we're already swimming against the current a little bit when we decide that we want to cultivate a worldview that actually reaches out for what makes us happy, mm -hmm. for what brings us awe and wonder and contentment and a sense of hope and aspiration, all those kinds of things. So we're going to be talking about all that stuff today. But to begin with, there's this nature in, nature out thing. Right. And if you're anything like me and all the pagans I know, you've got rocks and sticks <laughs> and plants and dried flowers and just all kinds of stuff, seashells and fossils and just all kinds of things from the natural world inside your house because those things bring you joy. Mm -hmm. Yes. A lot of those things end up in our pockets and, you know, first they end up <laughs> in the laundry pile and it all has to come out of the laundry and then it gets arranged around the house and, and all of that. And I think that's, it's about what are we paying attention to, mm -hmm. right? Because those things are everywhere. The beautiful, I mean, next time you're sitting next to some gravel, for a while right gravel seems like it might be boring but if you're sitting there because you're waiting for a bus to come or whatever it is just start looking at each of those individual rocks and just the way that the light is shining off of each of them and thinking about the history of how that rock formed how many millions of years ago and how it's been tumbled and all what has happened to it and I think that the the collecting of those things is a reflection of the interest that we have in them and the interest that we have in the world around us. Right, right. And that kind of curiosity, which of course is one of the Ethiopian principles, that kind of interest in the world is part of what engages us with the world, gives us a sense of being connected to the larger whole, gives us a sense of valuation of of all that is, right? So yeah, when you're looking at that gravel, I mean, you'll you'll see there are stones of different colors and obviously very different derivations, all there kind of mixed together in that gravel. And each one of those has a geological story. 
you know, it's it's got a chemical story. You know, the reason that they are particular colors is because they're made up of particular chemicals. And being curious about those things. And to be to be completely honest, you don't need to have a deep background in geology or in chemistry in order to appreciate this, to understand that that in the earth, these rocks were formed and then tumbled in the, the process of erosion, usually by water, but sometimes also by air, in order to form those little beads of gravel that you have before you. And when you have that revelation, sometimes what will happen is the, the, the ground will drop out from underneath you metaphorically, and you'll find yourself falling into this sense of amazement about the whole nature of deep time and the fact that we're here and the fact that we're a part of this wondrous, amazing whole that is planet Earth. Mm -hmm. And you'll probably take the rock with you. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Now, if you don't, right, if you're practicing some form of very strict minimalism or anything like that, no judgment. That's right? fine. That's fine. Yeah. It makes you happy. Yeah. That, you know, we, we as, as we keep saying, in naturalistic paganism, in atheopaganism, there is no cosmic taskmaster that wants you to do things a particular way. Mm -hmm. There is no pope who's going to lay down the rules for you. It's about developing a practice and a perspective and a set of personal habits that feed you on a spiritual and emotional level so that you can be a happier and more contented and more effective person and you can experience more joy out of your life. Right. That's the deal. Hmm. Yeah, it's amazing. It's it, it's amazing how rarely you hear anybody say anything like that in our society. You know, do what just do what feels good. Yeah. You're not hurting anybody, just do what feels good. Do that. Do that some more. Yes. Because it's, it's good for you. Right. But we're here to tell you weekly that that's that's <laughs> that's what we recommend. Right. So what are some of the things that you particularly enjoy in terms of do you, you know, is it dried leaves or sticks or, you know, is there something that you really enjoy bringing into your home? You know, it depends on the season. <laughs> I live about 30 miles away from the Pacific Ocean. And I don't get out there nearly as much as I would like to because 30 miles is enough to be a little bit of an impediment. Mm -hmm. But, and I have to go through all this magnificent redwood country to get there, <laughs> which kind of sidetracks me sometimes. But when I do go to the beach, I inevitably come home with a bunch of rocks and maybe a shell or two. And it's because it's a combination of them being polished very to, to a, a pretty high gloss for nature. And also that they're often wet. And so you can see their colors and their patterns more vividly mm -hmm. than when they're dry. And so I'll end up, you know, bringing those home. I, uh, Anne, a, a participant in our a Saturday mixer on a regular basis had a suggestion this morning that she says she puts them in potted plants. You know, the it, okay, I got a cool rock. Now it's going in a potted plant. If you're getting them from the ocean, rinse the salt off first. Mm -hmm. That's important because, you know, most plants are not very salt tolerant. They don't like it. Right. We actually do that as well for a very practical reason. Is we have a cat in our house and sometimes he decides that other things will be his litter box. And so we put pine cones and, and rocks and things like that into the potted plants and that prevents him from doing that. Oh, wow. I, yeah. I have not heard of that problem before, but that is Oh, really? That's a, it's a cat. Yeah. I mean, he's pretty good about not doing it now. But when we lived in a smaller apartment, yeah, sometimes he would just decide that that was going to be his litter box instead. Oh. <laughs> so, um, <laughs> but the shells and the wet rocks, we actually, so two weeks, but the reason we missed the podcast a couple of weeks back is that my family, we went out to Florida for my brother's wedding. 
And so I took the kids to the beach for the first time in their life and they were they were delighted. And of course we came back with several gallon bags of shells because that mm -hmm. was we I mean how how could you not, right? Shells and rocks and little, you know, dead dried up coral things and and all of that. And one of the things that we've done is taken a big vase and put some of the water in it and then in the water in the the glass vase because there just is something about it being in the water right yeah. they're just much more visible that way that's wonderful that's a great idea yeah and of course we have ones that aren't and you know they're they're being sorted by color over and again and all of that but but that's just been my favorite thing so far and actually we took a few little pieces of dried up seaweed that was left on the and that's in there too that won't last quite as long as the rocks and shells will right well that's really great i am I mean, I love the desert and I've spent a lot of time in the American desert, but the having the opportunity to see a place that's that has the ocean and is very wet and all that kind of stuff, you know, for your kids, I'm sure was just really magical. I have to share just one thing as we were we flew there. And so this was also their first airplane trip. And we went we we stopped in you know, Dallas on the way to get there. Mm -hmm. And my daughter was looking out the plane and she looked down the, cause I made sure to get window seats for the kids since, mm -hmm. you know, they're going to be first airplane ride. And she's looking down and she goes, mom, the ground is green. <laughs> because, you know, we the farthest we'd ever been is, is into Colorado with her, which is very similar southern colorado and northern new mexico are very similar so she hadn't really right. seen anything like that before and just them seeing that kind of grass we have plenty of grass here but it's golden right yeah and it will pop green for like a month during the the monsoons but the rest of the time it's just this golden brown and so they were just fascinated at seeing you know grass on the ground and seeing mm -hmm. all those kinds of trees so yeah we spent a lot of time and there were so many things we, you know, they wanted to bring back, but I had to inform them that we, unfortunately, we can't take this on the airplane. And, and those big, <laughs> giant, beautiful leaves are not going to last when we take oh, them. Oh, yeah. Off. Yeah. Like the giant monstera and the I, banana trees and, you know, all yeah. these wonderful things. And we have a banana tree plant in our house, but of course it gets to like three feet tall. And the ones that we were looking at, I mean, they were just humongous. The leaves right. were as big as their bodies and going, you know, we're going to take some photos, but those aren't going to come. Those can't come home with us. <laughs> you know, we could take the cool rocks and the shells. Those will last. So yeah. that's something to think about in your own environment, you know you know, we cut things and bring them in sometimes, but some things are going to stay very well in the home and some things aren't going to stay very well. Right. So. Yeah. So you were asking about what kinds of things I bring in. And one example was mm -hmm. rocks from the, from the coast. For whatever reason, we have very few shells on our coast now. And that was not the way that it was when I was a child. There's been a tremendous die off of, you of think shellfish. Acidification? Maybe probably from a combination of warming and acidification. Mm -hmm. So I don't see that as much as I did when I was a child, but, but the rocks are there. And of course the, the, the California coast is very rugged. It's got these sort of cliffs and bluffs and it's beautiful. stuff yeah. and it's really just very beautiful to be there. And even on a weekend, I can usually find a cove on the Sonoma coast where I'm entirely by myself. Mm -hmm. which is amazing makes you feel like the last person on earth yeah so yeah bringing in those things and you asked about dried leaves as well i actually go on an excursion to get colored leaves for my focus my altar mm -hmm. in the fall there's a particular breed of a tree called a liquid amber which mm. i believe on the east coast is called a sweet gum Okay. And they they hold their leaves for much longer than many other trees. They'll hold them sometimes as long as into December. Okay. And they Is this a broadleaf tree or is it It is. It's okay. a broadleaf tree. And they go through these beautiful evolutions of color until they they're sort of a maroon red when they're when they're at the end of the whole cycle. 
-hmm. but you can you can pick them in various stages of development and then you have these leaves that are sort of green at the root and then yellow fading into orange and then red at the tips of the leaves just, just very very beautiful things and i like to decorate for the fall for for harvest and for hallows with those kinds of things there's just an awful lot of wonderful nature out there and, and it's it's hard not to want to bring it all back mm -hmm. <laughs> so do you have a certain you so you've got your focus do you have certain places in your house where you gather things or is it just sort of spread out everywhere um, around the house we we have a joke that our you know how people talk about architectural themes mm -hmm. different kinds of architectural styles well in our house the theme is welcome to the museum of natural history <laughs> we have glass cases with all kinds of various interesting things, historical things and natural things. We have, you know, bookshelves and all that kind of stuff. And and to be fair, every horizontal surface mm -hmm. has some cool thing on it. <laughs> and if, if it doesn't look like a cool thing, when you've heard the story about what it really is, you'll know what a cool thing it is. <laughs> nice. Like, he, here's an example. I, I have a piece of obsidian that's about this big. It's kind of... It's about a golf ball? Your, your whole, the, the audience can't yeah, see yeah, your hands. Oh, that, of course, yes. <laughs> it's, it's flat, but it's about as big around as a golf ball, and it's sort of heart-shaped. Okay. And it's heavily worn and eroded. And... Other than that, it just looks like a piece of obsidian that's been eroded and worn and all that kind of stuff. But what that is, is a dinosaur gastrolith. Oh. You, you find them in the rib cages of fossil dinosaurs. Mm -hmm. And they're, it's from the gizzard of the dinosaur, right? That collects gravel to help them digest their food. Right. So, I mean, it's an amazing thing. My grandfather found it and I've had it since i was a kid so even it was a things... rock swallowed by a dinosaur that's right to help it digest it, ground up and digest its food that's right wow <laughs> <laughs> yeah cool thing to have eh yeah <laughs> so i mean it's gotten to the point where i actually wrote an interpretive guide for our house <laughs> so that okay. people know what all the the various exhibit things are mm -hmm. that sense of wonder is something that, and we'll talk about this later on in this episode, that's something that I really cultivate. Mm -hmm. That sense of amazement, like, wow, maybe a hundred million years ago, a dinosaur swallowed this rock. <laughs> and then yep. it did duty for long enough to get all the edges worn off of it into a nice smooth mm -hmm. pebble until the dinosaur died. Yeah. You know, just extraordinary thing to think about. Mm. So how about you? How about, uh, I I didn't really answer your question. We do have other places yeah. where we'll put things like colored leaves in the fall and stuff like that. But it sounds like you do more elaborate kind of household changes over the course of seasons. Yeah, our house is constantly moving. Right. And, and part of that is simply the, the age range of the people who live in the house. Yes. You can't really have something on a f flat surfaces that are low down. Do not get left alone for longer than 10 minutes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so there are certainly, you know, we have got bookshelves and things a little bit higher up that are slightly more permanent. But most things are, are changing very constantly. And, and there's the kids just, are getting taller. And the kids are getting, they're always getting taller and they're climbing, <laughs> right? Uh. Uh, no, they're pretty good now about not climbing onto things that they shouldn't, but they've, they've learned <laughs> mm. and that they, gravity has helped them learn about that. But, you know, things are, are changing and I purposely change things as well throughout the season. It's just something that, you know, every, I, I just start to kind of get that itch of, I want to change things around and you know things are coming into the house and things are going back out of the house and it's a just it just seems to flow quite a bit things are always flowing and moving out there are a few things that do end up staying for that are more kind of treasures that'll stay for longer like those 
seashells, right? Mm -hmm. Those are some of them will probably make their way outdoors eventually, but those things will probably stay. Sure. Right. And yeah, then I, I have seashells. I'm, I'm looking at one right now that I picked up on the Costa del Sol in Spain when I was 11. Mm -hmm. And it's still here with me. Yeah. And so, but then there's certain, like most of the windows are full of the, I really like the glass vases with things in them. Right. So we've got lots of those things and there's a snake skin in the window that we found a couple of weeks ago and, a, you know, that kind of stuff. And so it's just a very, I don't, it just feels to me like the house is cha changes with the season so much. And that's, some of that is just the style of how we live. And some of it was very purposely cultivated, mm -hmm. you know, it's in some ways it's easier for us because we are on this kind of homestead out away from people and live kind of half outside anyways but when we did live in a city that was that was kind of a way for me to try and feel more connected mm -hmm. because I, I definitely would start to feel very overwhelmed with the cityness of everything mm -hmm. so i would try and change the colors i would bring things in i don't do this anymore because where we live is so surrounded by creatures and things but i used to play bird songs Right. I had oh. recordings of water, of water flowing. I'd have recordings of rainstorms and birds. And I would just have that going on in the background as just a way to kind of, one, to block out the sound of the city, right? Because I found that very stressful of mm -hmm. there's the car alarm and then the police car going off and the this and the that and, the, you know, all of that. But, but just being able to sort of cultivate that. But now, you know, now the bird is like, two feet out my window and <laughs> and being plenty loud so uh -huh. and then certain places seem to collect certain things there's around the bathroom sink there's just rocks of all kinds and I think that's because they get brought in and washed off and then then they start to live there and so mm -hmm. now it just feels like yes of course bathroom sinks is where rocks go right <laughs> yes sounds reasonable to me yeah I mean, I can't think of anywhere else in the house that's more reasonable for rocks to go. Except maybe in a potted plant. In a potted plant, yes. My four-year-old seems to think the shoes by the door. But, you know. <laughs> <laughs> it's amazing uh, how often Legos end up in shoes by the door. You know, as you talk about all this, and, and I give my own examples and stuff, the word that comes to mind is curation. Mm -hmm. And it seems as though... One of the things about being alive is that there's this fire hose of information that's just kind of blasting us all the time, right? Mm -hmm. All the different sensory information and the news and the internet and, you know, the, the community events and scuttlebutt and gossip and what's happening with all the different people we're connected with all that stuff. And it's, so we're kind of being bombarded all the time. Mm -hmm. And I think a part of the, the life that we, you and I, Yucca envision for folks living in naturalistic paganism. And certainly I do for myself is one where we curate our experience in a way that's empowering and happiness producing rather than stress inducing or depression inducing or anxiety producing. Yes. Yeah. I love that. I, I think that's a wonderful way of putting it because really there's, there is so much around us. Right. And what, what do we choose to focus on? What do we choose to bring into focus? That's something that we do have, power and influence over mm -hmm. right mm -hmm. you know we don't get to there's a lot of things that we don't get to change right. in life there's most things the vast vast majority of things we have absolutely no control over right but what we're focusing on what we find important we do have control over that and that really changes our experience of what it's like to be us right yeah, we do have control over those things. And it's it's one of those situations where you have to make the decision to grab the wheel, mm -hmm. right? 
because otherwise you're basically at the mercy of two things, which is the randomness of whatever information is flying towards you and that evolutionary pre predilection for looking for problems and the negative. Right. So if you choose to be in more control around this, if you choose to be a curator of your experience, then you can get in the habit of smelling the roses along the way when you're walking from the parking lot into your workplace, stopping to look at what the clouds are doing, stopping to watch tree branches blowing in wind, you know, enjoying those rocks and shells and leaves and seed pods and all the cool things that nature makes. Mm -hmm. You know, this reminds me of a book, actually, that I read a few years back and was really, really influential. And it was, it's called Digital Minimalism. It's by, mm -hmm. I, I believe, Cal Newport. And it isn't what the title sounds like at first. The title sounds like being like anti-tech or like a Luddite or something. But it's actually about really being thoughtful about the role that the screen and digital things play in our lives. And he does this a, a very beautiful job of, well, one, he does spell out kind of the, the terrible state some of that is in and how the attention, that, that's all designed to hold our attention as long as possible. And it's not really done in a way that is, that's thoughtful about our well-being. It's more about the pockets of the people designing these mm -hmm. programs. But it it does a really lovely job of of walking one through to think about what are the things that they that you really value and how do you cultivate that and how do you create a life in which you can focus on those things and how do you use tools like the how do you use digital tools to help you do that and how do you let go of the ones that aren't helping you to do that well, that so sounds just, great. Yeah, so I'd really, I, I like quite a bit of Cal Newport stuff. So that's digital minimalism, if anyone is interested in checking that out. Why don't out. we put a link to that in the show notes? Yeah, let's do that. Yeah, because when you think about it, one of the few things that we really have choice about in our lives is our attention, mm -hmm. right? We We can make considered, thoughtful, informed decisions about where we're going to apply our attention. And that can be on things that bring anxiety or bring or or help us to, you know, re-experience trauma. And we call those triggers. Mm -hmm. I heard a wonderful term in the mixer this morning from our community member Summer, who said that she heard this term glimmers. Mm -hmm. which are like the opposite of triggers. They're things that fill us with hope and inspiration and a sense of joy in living. Mm. We, can, we can look for those things, right? I had this moment yesterday. I was sitting in a cafe waiting for a friend and the door to the cafe opens and this little boy trots in. Mm -hmm. He's on the move. He's he's he, he must he couldn't have been more than four. I don't think <laughs> he was three or oh, four. okay. So real little little guy. Yeah, beautiful little black kid with this gigantic grin on his face, and his mother comes in behind him and closes the door, and he was just and, and then he stands there with his feet planted and his hands kind of out by his side. He's like, "This is a cafe, wow." <laughs> and you could just see that he was drinking in this experience of having come into this new space mm -hmm. and looking around you know what are people doing what are they doing in this place what's it all about mm -hmm. and you know with it with this 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 just this glow of happiness and i just i i couldn't help but smile i wanted to watch that kid for a while you know so that was a glimmer mm -hmm. That's such a delightful idea about a glimmer, right? Because, and I, I think that there could be a lot of power in just taking a moment to think about what are the things that that are your glimmers or could be your glimmers, right? Because we mm -hmm. can 
we can choose to have those associations as well that you're taking the time to focus on okay what are the things that inspire awe in me and that make me hopeful or whatever it is and just taking the, the time to think about those i think is really is really great and then finding them throughout the day right right, right. and and figuring out maybe some rules of thumb for how to keep yourself in that state to as great a degree as possible. Now, I'm not saying never watch the news. Mm -hmm. You know, I we ha I feel like as a responsible person, I have to be engaged with what's happening in my society, and I need to make what effort I can to have things go in in a way that's consistent with my values. But that there's a difference between that and being obsessed with the news, and it's just wave after wave of oh my god they can't do that they're oh my god they're doing that <laughs> you know this this terrible terrible you know wave of feelings so you can curate that you can narrow it down you can tell yourself okay i'm going to log on to my favorite news site once a day and i'm going to read the headlines and i'll read a couple of stories that seem like they're useful you mm -hmm. know for me to know and then i'm going to move on and i'm going to do other stuff that feeds me more Right. Yeah. I think that's really important and to create that balance and that by, by choosing to log off after that time, you're not being a bad citizen, right? No. You're not being a, like, you don't have to buy into the, the guilt around it because those moments of joy, like you were talking about the little kid coming in, that is as valid as any of the other stuff right that mm -hmm. is as much valid part of existence and this life in this world and giving it your attention is something that it's one it's worth attention in its own but also it's good for you mm -hmm. you're going to do a better job being a more effective person in the world when you are more balanced and and healthy and happy Absolutely. if you're miserable you're not going to do it you're not going to be able to do as good a job taking care of the things and helping whatever the situation is that you want to help right right because despair is disempowering right fundamentally when we despair we throw up our hands and say well that's the way the world is nothing i can do about it and it, it just sucks but that's life Mm -hmm. And that's a terrible message to tell to yourself and to anyone around you. Right. I, you know, I, I frequently go back to the deathbed test, right? How am I going to feel about how I chose to operate in my life when I'm dying? Mm -hmm. And what I hope is that I'm going to look back at all this and go, wow, what an adventure. Mm -hmm. There was just such amazing stuff all along the way with that and just such beautiful times and moments and what a world this is rather than well i didn't solve world hunger so i guess i failed right you know something like that some kind of unreasonable expectation that's informed by a a, a situation that's really kind of beyond any one individual's capacity to change. Right. Now, I think that there's also another part, another kind of side of this is when we're looking for the things that are going to bring us joy and the things that make us hopeful and inspire awe and all of that, that there will be times in our life when we don't feel those things. Right. Yes. There will be times when we aren't happy about something. There will mm -hmm. be times when you get cut off or in traffic or your spouse says that thing again or all of those. And that's those things are part of life. And those are things that for the most part, we really don't have control over. Right. And that's OK. Right. But what we yeah, can do I mean, is, if you're in grief, yeah. if you're in grief, you should not be expecting yourself to you know, carefully cherry pick all the, the beautiful things about the world because you're in grief. And the yeah. same is the same, I, I have to say, as someone who has lived with major depression since I was a little kid, 
depression does not indicate a failure of what we're talking about in this podcast. Mm -hmm. Depression is a neurochemical condition. It's something you can't help. It's something that's not your fault. It's not a moral failing. And if you find that your world is really dark and gray and, and dismal because of it, don't pile on top of it, all the other messages you're getting from your brain that you should be, you know, looking for butterflies. <laughs> that's, that's not fair to you. And it's not accurate to the situation. That is, that's, that's not a realistic statement. Right. It's not a, and it's not a failure on your part. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. So there's, there's things in the world that we really we do not have control over but but a lot of the things that we're talking about today are the things that we that we can influence and focusing on which of those things can we influence and and those are the those are the places where i think we have a lot of power is figuring out what what do we actually have power over which mm -hmm. isn't a lot but actually when you really get down to it it is right Mm -hmm. I don't have po power over what you're doing, Mark, but I do have some influence over how I'm going to respond to whatever you're doing is. And that's going to take time, right? It's not like I can just magically say like, oh, I'm not, you know, I'm going to respond this way. Like, no, it doesn't really work that way. It's something that we practice. And that's where I think a lot of the stuff that we talk about on the podcast, like rituals and different kinds of practices can really help because they're a way for us to practice and learn how to change our responses yes yes that's really well said i'm i mean i know i know some pagan people just a few a handful whose ritual practices have fallen way off after years of you know religiously literally religiously <laughs> observing all the sabbaths and you know having a personal practice and all that kind of stuff and what's happened is they've gotten to the point where they're able to curate their lives such that there is a sense of celebration and interconnectedness and appreciation going on most of the time. Mm -hmm. And when it's not, it's for good reasons. And they have tools for, for working with that. Mm -hmm. So... You know, when we talk about having a ritual practice, the point of having a ritual practice is not to have a ritual practice. The point of having a ritual practice is to create moments. Moments when we celebrate, moments when we're joyful, moments when we're connected, when we see ourselves in the true magnificence of what we are, right? And so that that's why we encourage a ritual practice right but but the point the point was always the outcome the point was the happiness and the improvement of happiness in the world mm -hmm. that's 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 where we're going with all this so if you don't have much in the way of a ritual practice and you still find yourself feeling very contented and appreciative and humble and connected and all those things well good for you yeah right. you, you know if it ain't broke <laughs> right but you know there's the great thing is that there's a lot of different ways to there's a lot of different ways to live mm -hmm. right and each of us is going to have something a little bit different and our goals are going to be a little bit different and there's going to be different ways of of meeting those goals and so that some of the things we've been talking about today are are tricks and tools that we can use to cultivate some of that, right? And sometimes that may be really paying attention to that gravel and bringing a little piece home with you. And sometimes it maybe it's that finding what your glimmers are. And maybe it's having a nightly practice with your focus, right? Or a circle at the solstice or something like that. So I, right. I really appreciate, Mark, that we get to explore some of these ideas on the podcast and that 
all you folks are here listening and sending your emails in and being part of that discussion. Oh, me too, so much. And it is so gratifying when I see on the Ethiopian Facebook group or the Discord server or in one of the Zoom gatherings, when people say, you know, oh, I, I discovered this through the podcast or, you know, that podcast episode two weeks ago really resonated with me and it's changed how I do X and Y. I mean, that's what feeds me and keeps me going, right? The idea that, you know, it's not like you and I have all the answers, but we can share what perspectives we have Mm -hmm. and collectively we can all get better yeah which is you you know the rising tide right raising (laughs) all the boats yeah and so you know that's that's really what i find moving and and motivating about you know doing this and once again i am so grateful that you you suggested doing a podcast and we were able to collaborate in this way i think it's worked out so well that's it's been a joy really so this sounds like we're stopping we're 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 not <laughs> uh, we're, we're just yeah. we're just a mutual admiration society yeah but we do have something that we want to mention another venue format for more of this great stuff right um, um, that's coming we, up you yep. you may if you're in the Ethiopian community in one way or another you have probably heard by now of the Ethiopian Web Weaving Online Conference, which is going to be held by Zoom on June 3rd and 4th. And we just want to remind you that that's going to happen. If you And we'll put a link to the, the, the web page where you can go to register and download the program and all that kind of stuff in the show notes. The, the keynote speaker is going to be Jared Anderson, who also goes by the crypto naturalist. He's this beautiful poet of nature and appreciation for the cosmos. Just really lovely stuff. And I was interested to learn, he's he's actually got a book coming out, I think in two years, which is about his struggle with depression mm. and how that has led him to the natural world, which sounds awfully familiar to me. Mm. So I'm looking forward to reading it when that comes out. But in the meantime, we get to hear him as our keynote speaker. And so really encourage you to register for that and to come to that event. It's over those two days, June 3rd and 4th, lots of interesting workshops and activities, opportunities to socialize. So go ahead and click that link down below and we hope to see you there. Yep. So thank you so much, Yucca. This is this has just been another lovely conversation. I really appreciate it. Likewise. And we'll see you all next week.